so now we're going to switch gears, and I'd like to talk about Blue Origin. And I want to start with the crest. Yeah. And uh, my Latin isn't very good, so I'm going to start by asking you to tell me uh, how to pronounce that. All right, Gudatum Frositor. That's how we pronounce it. And um, I'm not actually, I actually have been told that's not the right way, but that's the way I like to say it. <laughs> and um, Gudatum Frositor. And uh, it means step by step ferociously. And that's why we have, you'll see the two tortoises up there. Our mascot is the tortoise because we believe uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And you have to do everything one step at a time. If you're building a flying vehicle, you can't cut any corners. If you do, it's going to be an illusion that it's going to make it faster. You can't cut any corners. You have to do it step by step. But you do want to do it ferociously. And that's why at the bottom, we have the winged hourglass, which is a Victorian cemetery symbol that means time is fleeting. So we don't have forever. So you do it step by step, but you do it ferociously. That's terrific. And tell me about the meaning of the feather. By the way, I have tortoise cufflinks. You probably can't see them, but... Well, those are cool. Yeah. Tell me about the meaning of the feather. Oh, the feather is simple. It's just a, a symbol of the perfection of flight. And, uh, you know, for thousands of years, we humans have been looking up at the birds and wondering what it would be like to fly. And this museum is a testament to the power of that and how, uh, you know, how passionate people are about it. And I think it's representative of uh, freedom and exploration and mobility and progress. Uh, there's really nothing for the people who are uh, in love with flight there is no substitute. Yeah. So this next image, uh, all of your testing is done in, in Texas. Yeah. Stan, and Peter wants to know if he can order a set of those boots from Amazon Prime. <laughs> no, but that's a damn good idea. I think we should, we should think about that. I know uh, Peter will order a set if you can we, set them up. Uh, yeah, but that's a, that's a very good idea. Gradatum Froster boots. Now, this whole started back with uh, yeah. your proof of concept, on. which is also across the street. Yeah, you, you guys have this here in, in your collection. This is the first vehicle that Blue Origin flew uh, many years ago. Uh, it's a vertical landing, vertical takeoff, vertical landing vehicle. It's jet powered instead of rocket powered. And we did it as a test bed to play around with guidance and control algorithms, vertical landing. Uh, and those jet engines, our 1960s era jet engines that we refurbished, that we bought from the South Af African Air Force. We bought a bunch of them and managed to get four of them to work. The and, noise was uh, amazing. Oh, they're so, it's so loud. It's <laughs> kind of a thing of beauty, actually. So when, when are we gonna get to fly on? Well, we're hoping to do our first human flight. So this is a suborbital vehicle. Uh, it's named after Alan Shepard, so the first American to go into suborbital space. Uh, and we're hoping to do our first uh, uh, human flight in uh, late 2017, and we're hoping to do our first uh, you know, paid flight uh, with commercial uh, passengers in 2018. So soon. Things we have a whole well. table full of Boeing test pilots over there that want to get in line to do it. <laughs> I told them the line form is behind me. I see some raised hands. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I want to share another uh, image, or uh, rather a video, from uh, the testing for the escape system. Yeah. Uh, and also I wanted to highlight these. Uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, one parachute out. This is a crushable structure on the bottom to make that... Uh, yeah, smooth. that's right. That upper left-hand image is the crushable uh, structure after it's been removed. There, there are multiple layers of defense for uh, for failed uh, subsystems. So if we have a shootout, the landing will be harder than if we're landing on three shoots. Uh, so we have you know uh, energy absorbing systems in the seats. We also have this energy absorbing system at the base. And even with the one shootout, we saw almost no crush in that system. Uh, it's because the retro thrust system works so effectively. Yeah. And one of your most recent tests was in the escape system. Yeah, and this was a very um, aggressive test. This is a, uh, a Max-Q escape. Max-Q is maximum dynamic pressure. And as you guys uh, can probably imagine, the faster a vehicle goes through the air, the more dynamic pressure there is from the air on that vehicle. But if you're going up, the air is also getting thinner. So at a certain height, uh, the pressure actually starts to decline again, even if your speed is increasing because the air is thin. In our, for our vehicle, uh, maximum dynamic pressure happens at about Mach 1, 
at about 16,000 feet. And so we wanted to test the escape system, which is a pusher escape system, unlike all of the other escape systems that have ever been flown, have been tractor escape systems. So our escape motor is embedded in the base of the crew capsule, uh, and that's what you're going to see. Yeah. That's a frame by frame, and you'll see the booster remarkably fly out. That's the SRM exhaust. It's 5,000 degrees, 70,000 pounds of thrust, and it's it directly impacting the booster, which is doing its best to fly through that disturbance. It can't be good for the booster. It, the booster was never designed to survive this event. Right, and the, I think you thought the booster would not... We did not think the booster would survive this. Our Monte Carlo sims showed that there was a chance it would survive, but the Monte Carlo sims don't model a lot of the phenomenon that we see in this. But the booster just flies right through the disturbance, even though it's now at max Q, with, and the forward shape of the vehicle is now a ring fin. <laughs> And it proceeded on and, and it proceeded on, landing. went up to over 300,000 feet, and then came back and made a perfect landing. That's awesome. <laughs> So we've talked a little bit about the new Shepard. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the new Glenn. New Glenn. So you can see it there uh, towards the right next to the uh, Saturn V. The new Glenn is our next step. And uh, so, you know, I said new, new Shepard is named after Alan Shepard, the first American in space. New Glenn is named after John Glenn, the uh, first American to orbit the Earth. Uh, new Glenn comes in two variants. There's a two-stage uh, vehicle and a three-stage vehicle. The first two stages in both variants are uh, fueled with uh, liquefied natural gas uh, as the fuel and liquid oxygen as the oxidizer. The upper stage uses the same engine that we use on an, an upper stage variant, vacuum optimized variant of the BE3 engine, which is our liquid hydrogen engine. Uh, and this, this is a large vehicle with almost 4 million pounds of thrust. It's designed to put lots of people or big objects in space. We'll use it to do both uh, commercial uh, payload missions uh, for satellite companies and we'll uh, use it to lift humans into space and we'll be flying it by the end of this decade. We've already been working on it for about four years uh, and, uh, and uh, have done a lot of work on not just the vehicle design but the BE-4 engine which is the, there are seven uh, uh, BE-4 engines in the booster. Uh, each one has 550,000 pounds of sea level thrust. Uh, and you can see it there in its landed configuration. It'll land downrange on a ship. And so obviously, Glenn and Shepard, you hinted at Armstrong. We're, we can't wait yeah, to hear about no, that. And you know, this is, this is an important step. You know, our vision is millions of people living and working in space. We want to build a, 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 a system, a, a, we want to reduce the cost of getting into space dramatically by focusing on reusability. And what I know, when I look at um, Amazon and the dynamism that I've seen the last 20 years on the internet, it's incredible. It's, it's not just Amazon, there are thousands of companies, startups, on the internet, two kids in a dorm room with a good idea can change the world. That's really hard to do in the space business because the price of admission in the space business is so high. You need literally, really to do super interesting things. You need hundreds of millions of dollars uh, as a kind of baseline price of admission, which really cuts back on the college dorm room kind of entrepreneurialism. <laughs> and, um, and so Amazon got started with very small resources and we could do that because we didn't have to build the heavy infrastructure. You know, we didn't have to build the shipping system. There was already the Postal Service and UPS. We didn't have to build the internet. It existed, really, it was built on top of the long distance phone network. We didn't have to build a payment system. There was already credit cards. And so, once the heavy lifting is done, thousands of brilliant entrepreneurs can come in and creatively, you know, do new things. And the problem with uh, doing entrepreneurial things in space right now is that first step. It's getting off Earth. It's just way too expensive, and it'll always be too expensive as long as we're throwing the hardware away in the ocean every time we use it. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to do. We want to make that, if I can be 80 years old, and actually it's very inspiring to see these kids at Rice Beck Aviation High because 
um, they're the generation that if we can make that infrastructure step, provide that low cost access to space, they will figure out how to creatively use it. They will be the generation that does the equivalent of what I've witnessed on the internet. And it would be incredible. And that's you know, nothing would make me happier when I'm 80 years old to see that happen. That would be so darn cool. And so your guys are busy building. Yeah, this is our, uh, the Florida manufacturing facility that you have here. We leased uh, Launch Complex 36 from the Air Force, and uh, we're building, this is a big, it's a big vehicle. Uh, it's 23 feet in diameter. Uh, it's very tall, it's 300 feet tall. You really don't want to move it around uh, very much. So we built the uh, final assembly plant uh, right there in uh, just miles away from the launch site. So we can do all the final assembly near the launch site. And once you get these low cost launches, some of these dreams of-, of Yes, then we get to see, you know, uh, uh, Gerard O'Neill's ideas start to come to life and many of the other uh, ideas from science fiction. You know, the dreamers come first. It's always the science fiction guys. They think of everything first and then the builders come along and they make it happen, but it takes time. Uh, and, but, but, but we know what to do. We'll get out there and we'll find amazing things in space. We need to go into space if we want to continue to have a growing civilization. If you take baseline energy usage on Earth and compound it at just 3% a year for less than 500 years, you have to cover the entire surface of the Earth in solar cells. And that's just not going to happen. So if we want to continue to grow, we either, you know, we could, we, another route would just be to face stasis uh, and not continue to grow. I don't think that's as interesting. I don't think you want to just survive on this planet. I think you want to, you know, uh, thrive and do amazing things. And to do that, we need to go out into the solar system. I predict that in you know, the next few hundred years, all heavy industry will move off planet. It'll just be way more convenient to do it in space where you have better access to resources, better access to 24 seven solar power. You know, solar power on Earth is not that great because the planet shades us half the time. In space, you get solar power all the time. So there'll be a lot of advantages to doing heavy manufacture there and Earth will end up zoned residential and light industry. Um, and, you know, we want to go to space to save the Earth. I don't like this plan, I don't like the plan B idea that we want to go into space, you know, so we have a backup planet. We have looked at this solar system, we've sent probes to every planet in this solar system, and believe me, this is the best planet. Uh, there is no doubt this is the one that you want to protect. It's the jewel. We evolved here. We're kind of made for this planet. And uh, uh, it's gorgeous, and, uh, and we can use space to protect it.